Well, we're starting a new sermon series in the Old Testament book of Ezra. One of the key themes that we'll see in this this journey through Ezra is the theme of restoration. We see a God who restores. I called the series Hope Restored. I called this first sermon A God Who Stirs. I really do encourage you just to take some time to read through the whole of Ezra chapters 1 and 2 and just familiarize yourself with uh, the details in the story. It is an incredible section to dig through and I hope to just uh, help you to see some of the incredible fulfillments that are taking place as God is restoring um, his people to their place. He's restoring the temple. Um, He's restoring proper worship of himself. As always, just take some time to also pray and ask God to open your eyes to see wonderful truths about him in this text and pray that uh, you wouldn't just be doing this as an academic exercise, but that as God shows you truths about himself, that he will indeed stir your own heart, that you would love him more and seek to serve him more fully. Before we dig into the text specifically, I just want to uh, highlight a tool that I used in in understanding this passage. It's a very useful tool in Old Testament narrative. Um, it's called the narrative plot arc. Uh, and what you're looking for uh, when using this tool is the setting. You're looking for the conflict that is set up in the story. Right at the top, you're looking for your point of uh, climax, the climax of the story. Then you see how from that point the story resolves and then you're given a new setting. In this story, the setting is given in chapter 1, chapter 1 verse 1, where we see, we're told that in the first year that Cyrus was king of Persia. Now, if you go and do a little bit of digging, you will see that this is the year 538 BC. So the Persians have taken over from the Babylonians. Cyrus is now king on the throne in Persia and uh, that is our setting. Now the conflict is given in chapter 1 verse 2 to 4 and we see that Cyrus makes this proclamation to say that God's people can go home back to Jerusalem. They can rebuild the temple and he says that he's going to give them everything they need for this rebuild, re- rebuilding um, project. So that is setting up the conflict in that it's setting up tension in the story. This pagan king is sending them home. Is this actually going to happen? Early on in the story, chapter 1 verse 5, we are given the climax as we see God stirring the hearts of his people, people of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites. He stirred their hearts to go back to rebuild his house in Jerusalem. So that is uh, what I saw as the climax of the story. And then we see the story resolving itself uh, from chapter 1, verse 6, all the way through to chapter 2, verse 67, uh, where we see... 1 verse 6, their neighbors assist them with things to rebuild. The king himself sends back articles from the temple. And then we're given the inventory. And then from chapter 2, we are given this list of names. All the people who returned, all the priests and the Levites, um, the total number of the group who returned. So that is kind of resolving The climax has been, yes, the people are going to return. This shows that the conflict of The king saying, go and I'll give you what you need for the work. Um, All of that being resolved in these these verses. And then the new setting is given in chapter 2, verse 68 to 70. So these last few verses, as we see the people back in the land and they are now ready to rebuild. So this is a useful tool to keep in mind if you're looking at Old Testament narrative. Um, Now we're going to just dig into the text for a few minutes. 
and just look at a, a few key characters in the text. So obviously, um, it starts with Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he is uh, a key character in this opening section. But ultimately, the key player in this uh, narrative is the Lord God himself, who moves hearts. Um, Cyrus refers to him, the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of Israel. And we see again here that God moved the hearts. Everyone whose heart God had moved or had stirred. We see here the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus. So as I said, that could be stirred. And so we see, yes, King Cyrus is mentioned as a key player, but actually it is the Lord God doing the stirring here. And the writer tells us, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord, um, that is important just to, to note down, this is all happening in fulfillment of God's word. Um, Jeremiah is mentioned, but actually there's more than just Jeremiah's um, prophecies being fulfilled here. There's prophecies from Isaiah being fulfilled. There's um, things that happen in Exodus happening again in this story. So there's a lot of fulfillment of promises happening here. So just to, to note down a few here, we've got Jeremiah 25, verse 11 to 14. Um, those verses are where God says, after 70 years, I will send you back. Uh, we've got Jeremiah 29, verse 10 and onwards, where again, he says, after the 70 years, I'll bring you back. Got Jeremiah 32, verse 36 to 38. And he again says, I'll bring you back and I will be your God. Then you've also got the fulfillment of passages like Isaiah, um, the end of Isaiah 44, verse 28 through to 45, verse 13, where Cyrus himself is mentioned. Now, this is amazing because this happened 200 years before Isaiah had prophesied that God would raise up somebody called Cyrus who God would use as his instrument to send his people home from Babylon. So there's incredible fulfillment of promises happening in this section. And actually the whole of Ezra will see God fulfilling his promises in incredible ways. Um, in Isaiah, Cyrus is actually called the Lord's anointed one. And the key focus in this big section is uh, the call to rebuild the temple at Jerusalem and Judea. And then not only rebuilding the temple itself, but also making sure that the right people would be there for this rebuilding project. So the gatekeepers of the temple, uh, the temple servants. Uh, we'll look at the priests and the Levites in a moment, temple servants. And they've gone back to the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, in order to rebuild the house of God on its site. So the temple is um, key in focus here. And again, that's important for us to note because this is much bigger than just a people going home. They are going home to rebuild the temple. The temple was the place where blood sacrifices were made for the sins of the people. It was the place where the people's relationship with God in the Old Testament times could be restored. So the temple is key for them rightly worshipping God. Now, throughout this section, we see a whole lot more fulfillment taking place. Um, in Isaiah 44, verse 28, God had said that they would rebuild the temple. So this is happening. Um, there's fulfillment from Jeremiah 16, verse 15, just showing that God is going to keep his word. If you think about the story in Exodus, where God rescued his people from Egypt, we're told that they plundered their Egyptian neighbors um, as the Egyptian neighbors gave them silver and gold. And here we see God doing it again. So God keeps his promises. God continues to supply for the needs of his people. Uh, here in 
uh, verse 7, we see all the articles from the temple that Nebuchadnezzar carried away being sent back. And again, this is a fulfillment. Jeremiah 27, verse 21 to 22. God said that everything's going to be taken from the temple, but at the right time, God would send it back. So what we see here is that God is keeping his word. He's doing incredible things, um, things that wouldn't happen apart from him moving the hearts of the king, moving the hearts of their neighbors, and moving the hearts of specific people who would actually go back and be about this restoration work that the Lord had promised to do. Just to note here, so Judah and Benjamin are mentioned. Uh, they obviously make up the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, many years earlier, in, in 722 BC, um, the Assyrians had come in and taken the northern tribe of Israel um, also into exile, and we never hear from them again. So the northern tribe uh, is gone. The southern tribe of Judah are now uh, the remnant of God's people who continue um, working out this plan of restoration. God's promises continue through them. It's very important, though, just to note, that it seems strange that we've got this Persian king saying things like, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me um, authority to rebuild this temple. And he seems to be almost speaking as a believer. But if you dig in, if you go and look at the Cyrus Cylinder, for example, um, the Cyrus Cylinder speaks about another Babylonian tribe and... Uh, Cyrus there refers to Marduk and he says Marduk your God has given me authority to do the same thing so although he says amazing things here he's actually just playing a political game to try and gain power for himself but he is still doing what the Lord had moved his heart to do so God is using even what he thought was for his own political gain the Lord is doing something much bigger in bringing his people home to rebuild the temple. And one of the telltales to show that Cyrus doesn't actually know this God is that he says, the God who is in Jerusalem. Now the Lord God is not contained in Jerusalem. He is the Lord God of heaven and earth. Um, and so this shows that Cyrus doesn't fully know the God who he is, he is speaking of here. But nonetheless, God is using him as part of his great plan. And then we see um, throughout chapter 2 that God raised up uh, the, the right people to be about this work. Uh, we meet Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Um, he seems to have been a, a key leader appointed um, by Cyrus as governor. Um, but we see some much more important names in this section. Here in the beginning of chapter 2 we meet Zerubbabel, uh, now, don't miss him. Zerubbabel is mentioned in Haggai chapter 2, 2 verse 23. Uh, he is mentioned as God's chosen signet ring. Um, then he's mentioned later in Matthew 1 verse 12 as a descendant of David. So God was preserving the line. He had promised that somebody from David's line would eventually be the promised forever king. So God, again, is keeping his word just by this mention of Zerubbabel. Um, and actually, ultimate restoration will one day come from this line as great King David's greater son, not Zerubbabel, but the Lord Jesus, will eventually be born. It's also important to see that the priests and the Levites are in this group, so they mentioned um, throughout chapter 2 here, um, all those involved in the work at the temple. Now, why are the priests important? Well, they are the ones who are going to make sure that uh, God is rightly worshipped in the temple, and that's what the people are concerned about, and that's why this little section where... Um, You've got uh, up to here. Um, these people, they couldn't work out, are these actually descendant of Israel? And then it says um, that they were excluded from the priesthood here. 
And this is just showing an intense concern for holiness. They wanted the worship at the temple, at the Lord's house, to happen properly. And they didn't want anybody who might potentially not be an Israelite uh, to be a part of this priesthood. Um, so the credentials of those coming back are checked very carefully. If you want to read up more about the Urim and the Thurim, uh, you can go to 1 Samuel 14, uh, 41 to 42. Uh, these were lots that were used by the priests to determine the Lord's will. Um, and then when we see this number here, it's both a large number and a small number. It's large enough to be considered significant, but it's also small compared with the original group who had come um, in the Exodus. So this is just a remnant. But it is a worshipping remnant. They are back because they want to rebuild the house of the Lord. Um, and they are very, very thankful. We, we see here that they have 61,000 derricks of gold. That's uh, 500 kilograms of gold, which in today's terms is like uh, 400 million rand, more than that. Um, and then the silver here they've got uh, is three tons of silver which in today's terms would be 36 million rand. So they are very thankful giving towards this work here. But much more than just giving money, what's happening here is that this is a remnant of people who have been stirred by God to actually give themselves. They're leaving the comfort of Babylon because they, that was all they'd ever known. They'd been there for 70 years. But the Lord stirred their hearts to go back to get things back in order so that they could rightly worship God again. And so what we see God doing is restoring his people. He's fulfilling his promises. He is a God who is to be worshipped. And that's why they go and rebuild the temple. And as we read this, we remember that this is the same God who we serve today. He's the same yesterday, today, in our day, and forever. And so we can look at him and trust that he is still a God who is going to stir hearts. He stirred our hearts to know him and love him. And he'll continue to stir hearts as we continue with the rebuilding, not the rebuilding of a temple, but the building of a people made of living stones, as Peter says, who will be a people who live for his worship. And so as you dig in further, I hope that God would... Uh, remind you of wonderful things from his word uh, that he would be stirring your heart and that as you teach this to others that you would show them wonderful truths as we see God at work in this uh, narrative ultimately stirring a people's hearts to go home and rebuild the temple for his glory's sake well God bless as you dig in further